little you cleared out last week without an air cleaner on it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when your air cleaner kind of separated, you know, valve fell grinding, apart. Valve grinding compound. That could be a problem. Yes. Right now? All right. Yes. Hey guys, John Talley here with PartZilla.com, and as you can tell, I am not in my garage, I am not in the studio, I am at the Barber Motorsports Park, here to do a driving event with Just Track It, and the group over at the museum, and what a museum it is, have agreed to let us in and broadcast from here, and I'm actually sitting here with the executive director of the museum, his name is Jeff Gray. And he has been with this uh, the setup since the inception, and we're going to be taking questions in regards to the barber, how it came about. I mean, anything you want to throw at this guy, for once, I'm not going to have to answer all the questions. I'm going to be able to turn it over to him as y'all let it flow in. Whatever you want to know about Barber, you know, the Motorsports Museum, this is the time to ask because he is the source and has all the information that uh, that, that is available for this place. All right, and they are starting to pour in, and they're going to start off pretty easy on you, it looks like. Great. Cal has one. Um, how did the museum get its start? Well, like most good museums, this thing started as a private collection. George Barber is a Birmingham businessman, and back in 1988, he decided he wanted to put together a car collection. And if you were aware of what was going around in, in the 80s, uh, of course, you know, Money was flowing pretty decent, and uh, a lot of car collections were starting up, and the car market was really strong. And you know, if you had a muscle car uh, or a sports car or uh, even an exotic, you know, the numbers were just going through the roof, and they were trading at auctions like stock market material was trading. But uh, he had a different taste, as you can tell. Uh, he wasn't quite looking at Ferraris, and he wasn't looking at, you know, the big block Chevrolets and stuff like that. He had a, a taste for the 40s, and uh, it's kind of a bland era. But he had put together the resources and the team to move forward with collecting these cars. Um, and the gentleman who was running the collection at the time was a big motorcycle enthusiast, and he was a retired employee of the Barber Dairies, which Mr. Barber owned. Okay. And uh, as the car collection was moving forward and resources were going into it, and um, uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm, but everyone was doing cars. Mr. Barber wanted to be a little different. So Dave Hooper, the gentleman who started the collection for him, said, why don't you look at motorcycles, George? He said, uh, motorcycles are great. You can see the engineering. You can see the design. You can understand what it meant to be. And you can put six motorcycles in the place of one car. Mm -hmm. And uh, with a car, you know, you look at that, you've got a great paint job and a set of hubcaps whenever you get through your restoration. Right. With a motorcycle, you know, everything's visible. Everything you need to see is there. You can understand all the aspects of what this machine does. So in 1989, the, the motorcycle started coming into the collection and it continued to grow. And it wasn't long before Mr. Barber realized there may be some benefits uh, tax-wise to go ahead and create a foundation, put it in the museum. Uh, so in 1994, the Barber Vintage Motorsports Museum was established and we opened the doors to the public. And uh, it's kind of interesting because we were only open three days a week, mm -hmm. Wednesday through Friday. Really didn't think we'd see a lot of attendance. Had over 10,000 visitors visit the museum during the weekdays, Wednesday through Fridays. No, so that's that, kind it, of interesting. At that point in time, was it everything that I'm seeing around us now, or what was the, the size of the building at that time? Well, it was a little different than what you see I, now. I can uh, imagine. We were in a warehouse on the south side of Birmingham. <laughs> uh, it was really interesting because he really didn't want it to be a high-profile situation. So, uh, we so really much for that. <laughs> didn't have a storefront. Uh, the restoration shop was in the middle of the exhibit area. Uh, we had about 300 motorcycles in the collection at the time the museum was formed, and about 25 or 30 cars that we had kept. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we started moving forward. Um, we got some legs under the collection, participating with ARMA in vintage motorcycle racing. Uh, we started that as a way to introduce the collection to the motorcycle collectors around the country. We figured if we could take bikes to a racetrack and we could race with other guys and we could demonstrate that not only could we restore a motorcycle, that motorcycle could be competitive on a racetrack, we was hopeful to get some in ways to collectors and stuff and uh, pay our dues, if you will, in the motorcycle collecting world being we were young at it. And we're really pleased successful at it. And we'll not forget in uh, 92, we showed up at Daytona and we had a brand new uh, Honda van. We had a brand new G50 Mashless and we all had white shirts and khaki pants on. And we showed up in the paddock down there at the Vintage Racing and we were kind of the laughing stock when we showed up that day. 
and at the end of the day, we had won both races we had entered in, so uh, we kind Last. of got off to a good start. Last we laugh. had a big pair of shoes to fill because everybody <laughs> expected us to win from that point forward. And uh, you know, from our racing career, we we wound that up around 1998, and we had uh, seven national championships. So it's a pretty good run for us. Wow. Tell me about this particular building. How, when did it come into being? Well, Mr. Barber was kind of shy about his collection. He really wasn't quite sure how the public would accept him being a businessman that had businesses in Birmingham and that perceived that he's out collecting motorcycles uh, with his proceeds from his community. And that really wasn't the case. He's very diverse in his portfolio. But we just kind of was very low-key, uh, like I say, open Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, and the, the motorcycle community was talking about us. But it really wasn't until the Guggenheim Museum in New York came knocking. Um, uh, Alton Guilfoyle was curating an exhibit for uh, Mr. Krenz at the Guggenheim, and he had reached out to us because uh, he had been going to other collectors, and they really weren't interested in loaning a bike to a museum in New York, especially not for four or five months. Uh, but when they contacted us, Ms. Barber recognized who they were and what they were. He said, whatever they need. So we, uh, we were a lender of 21 motorcycles to the Art of the Motorcycle exhibit in 1998. Uh, it wasn't until we were in Spain for the third exhibit with the Guggenheim that Mr. Barber realized that maybe there's something to this. <laughs> and with the turnout that we've got, because it was a record-breaking exhibit in New York, over 260,000 visitors over three months. Wow. Uh, it went to Chicago, it's Field Museum, broke records there as an exhibit. And then in Bilbao, Spain, it broke uh, records there as well. So we sat down and decided, what can we do with this collection for Birmingham, Alabama? And our first goal was to uh, locate a facility that would house the museum within the city limits, which was a challenge in itself, but we did. And then it was design a building. Mm -hmm. And the, the building had to be something that was simple, basic, did not take away from the motorcycles or the cars themselves, but was substantial and make an impact. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so we were looking for 40 acres with interstate frontage between Birmingham and Atlanta. Mm -hmm. We wound up at the end of the day settling with just about 900 acres here, just off that same interstate <laughs> exit, but uh, a little more diverse. Yeah, basically you, you go through a couple of different counties from the, uh, the front drive into when you come into the, uh, the, the entrance here. <laughs> it is an interesting <laughs> approach to get here, that's correct. <laughs> All right, well, Hank has another question. Uh, how many pieces or machines are currently here in the museum? That's good. That's a good one. Um, we've got about 1,700 motorcycles on inventory. Mm -hmm. And since we did the expansion three years ago, we can, we can exhibit about 1,000 bikes on the floor. Okay. Uh, the challenge we have is, you know, how many are too many? And uh, we do get the condition called cycle overload. Mm -hmm. and generally, when you visit the museum, we have five levels to see. A lot of people just get kind of a glazed over look after the third level and it just kind of goes into, wow. It, it, it's so much. I mean, the first time I came through, I said, well, I'll just walk through in a couple of hours. And I hadn't seen the building yet. And you could spend a couple of days in here easily. I mean, that you, is how many stories? Four or five? There's five levels for guests to visit on. And current. then you've got a basement as well where yeah, there's the, an additional overflow of six to seven hundred machines. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, the basement houses our restoration facility mm -hmm. as well as the motorcycle storage that's on site. Wow. How in the world did you manage to collect this diverse and this magnitude of machines? I mean, are these on loan? I mean, where did they all come from? Well, it's a good old-fashioned way of acquiring pretty much everything you buy. Every, and, everything uh, in here, Barbara. Er, everything <laughs> in this collection is owned by the foundation of George Barber. Um, you know, it's just the way to do things. You, if you borrow, uh, there's always going to be a situation that things aren't going to go the way you want them to. Right. Uh, you know, a tire is going to rot and somebody's going to be held accountable. That part wasn't missing when I loaned it to you or that scratch wasn't on it when I loaned it to you. So the way we avoid that is just simply own. Now, we started purchasing, it's making the acquisitions that way, but quite honestly, as the museum has grown, and the museum has grown in its reputation, and because we're a 501c3, mm -hmm. uh, we do get a large amount of charitable contributions. Okay. Uh, a lot of guys will donate motorcycles to the museum, and uh, that's been a great thing for us. Uh, that, that validates that we're doing something right, but at the same time, a quality bike that's donated will be you know, memorialized here. Mm -hmm. Now, I already have my favorite. You've got a 1979 Honda CBX, and that was one of the first sport bikes I ever rode when I was like 15 years old. I mean, so that's my favorite. Which one is yours? If you had to pick just one. 
Yeah, I know that's a tough question. Well, this is going to sound selfish, but uh, there is a 1971 Honda SL70 on display here. Okay. And it was my bike I got as a 12 year on my 12th birthday. Curiosity. And I've, I've kept it all these years and donated it to the museum last year. You wouldn't happen to have the uh, 73 XL70, would you? We do have an XL70. It's in the warehouse, not on the floor, but we do have one of those. That has well. the burnt orange paint with the that black? That's correct. That was my first one at 11. You know, that's, that's <laughs> the great thing about the collection, too, because we do have a lot of exotic machines. I mean, you know, get the Britain sitting here behind us, and a lot of people just, you know, would love to hear this thing run, and I've hardly ever seen one in person. Uh, but the biggest thrill we get is when guests are in the museum and you have a gentleman walk up to a T120 Triumph and he's got his grandson with him. And the grandfather sharing a story about that motorcycle with his grandson, that's a connection made. Or you have a young lady come in that uh, when she was in college, um, she had a uh, 50cc Honda and that was her campus bike. And she sees that again and she tells a story behind it. Or better yet, she tells a story about the boyfriend who had the motorcycle that uh, she had to meet him on the street corner by, by the house because oh, her parents wouldn't let him go out with him. But to hear those stories, and they're generally, you know, what we think of as common everyday bikes, but they, they hold a lot of value to people as far as emotions and, and uh, just to, to, to reminisce about their past. Okay. With all the machines you're, you've got on display, I mean, it, there's... It flows very naturally, very, very well. But how often do you actually change them out? And that there's some that we've talked about. They're almost impossible to get to without extreme mountaineering ability of your your staff members. I'm sure. But for the most part, how, how often do you um, just swap out the ones that can be accessed easily? Well. Accessibility really doesn't determine what we do. It, that doesn't. But we so do the ones I see up there, six stories, that doesn't matter. <laughs> that doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. Uh, the most important thing is maintenance. And okay. you know, we do try to maintain a environment here. Uh, we do the 70-50 rule with 70 degrees and 50% humidity. And we also move a lot of air, which okay. keeps dust from settling. Uh, but still, you have to take bikes down. Uh, we do keep some bikes wet. Most of them are pickled. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our own restoration facility where this is a uh, living museum where everything does run. Mm -hmm. So we do maintain a running condition. Um, and it, it's labor intensive. Sometimes you pull one down, you go through everything, you get all the fluids up and going, you crank it up, you run it, make sure all's good. You may have to replace some O-rings or some rubber grips or something, and then you dry it back out and put it on exhibit. How many min uh, hidden minions do you have down in the basement that do are just focused on restoration? Well, we're very fortunate that as far as paid staff members, I've got four guys that maintain the collection and do the restoration. Okay. But we could not maintain this without our volunteers and our docents. Um, okay. We've got some guys that uh, work on our uh, maintenance program that come in and work with our mechanics, and they will keep the bikes dusted. They will keep tires aired up. They will do the day-to-day -day maintenance on the machines. You know, this place is kind of like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You start on one end, when you get to the other end, it's time start to start over. back over again. And uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, some volunteers that do that. And we have uh, our docents and our volunteers that come in to serve as guest services. That if you're in the museum and you're kind of overwhelmed but you have a question, you know, we try to make sure we have staff available to answer those questions for you. And again, uh, we have to count on our volunteers and our docents for that because as large as this place is, you know, we've got about 150,000 square feet of accessibility now. It's hard wow. to cover it with one person. That, if not impossible. I know you're mostly concerned with the museum, but I've got to ask, tell me how the track came into existence. Now, I know it was primarily designed for motorcycles, but you actually have Indy cars that run here. I'm going to be out there all weekend uh, at a track event. How did it come into to being? Because it is one of the best world-class tracks I've ever been on. Well, I wish I could say it was part of the master plan all along. Mm -hmm. And in reality, the focus when we started this was a, a new home for the museum. Let's okay. get a, a worthy place to take the museum to. And because the land was available and we already had a collection and we already had the concept of the museum, and we were a living museum, mm -hmm. uh, we decided it would be great to have a place to exercise the exhibit. If we wanted to take a car out or take a motorcycle out, we didn't want to take it on public roads. So let's build a test track since we have the land. And um, as with anybody, you know, you start thinking about something you want to do, and you say, well, you know, we did it this way, it will cost this much, and for a few dollars more you can have this, and for a few dollars more you can have this. That's you, that's well, those the, few those dollars started buttons. kicking in, yeah. and it went from a test track to a, uh, a club track. Restoration. Our restoration shop. <laughs> it went from a test track then to, um, you know, possibly a club race track. And then it says, well, 
what would it take to be able to do professional AMA racing and maybe open wheel racing? You know, what about SECA? And the track designer we was working with, you know, of course, he was feeding this, saying, well, for a few dollars more, you can get this. <laughs> and it just turned into, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Right. And uh, remember, the whole mission here was to do something positive in our community. Right. Uh, you know, all the consultants we talked with about the museum said, well, this is great. You need to be in Orlando. If you're counting on heads coming through the door, you've got to be in Orlando. Well, Mr. Barber says, no. no. We're doing this for the city of Birmingham, so we're going to be in the city limits of Birmingham. So we also saw the track as an opportunity to help with tourism. It could be an economic tool. Uh, it's turned into a recruiting tool for the automotive industry. So this thing has paid dividends down the road. It's been pretty amazing for us. But uh, as you said, it is a level one, uh, excuse me, level one Formula One test facility. Uh, we really couldn't run a Formula One race here, but uh, we could test here for Formula One. Right. Uh, we ran AMA Superbike here until uh, the change is there. We do Moto America now. Uh, IndyCar came 10 years ago, and uh, you know the, the the drivers were a little disappointed. They said, you know, we're going to a motorcycle track to <laughs> race these cars. You can't Til do anything on a motorcycle track. <laughs> and it was uh, the second race that uh, they let their guard down, and uh, it's one of the favorite tracks on the circuit now because it requires driving skill. You know, yes. this is not go fast, turn left. It's not go fast, turn left, no. turn right. Uh, you have to think, and it's not a point and squirt track, it's a flowing track. So, you know, you can get into a rhythm, and everyone has their own rhythm, and uh, it's got its challenges, but the challenge is the same for everyone. So it's, yeah. it's, it's turned into a really great track. There's several turns you have to be set up for when you can't see the apex. <laughs> well, Charlotte's Web is one of the good ones. It's the last yes, four it turns in the track, and uh, if you get in trouble on the first turn going in, you're in trouble all the way through. Beth, you brought up Charlotte, and how did all those art pieces get their start? I mean, the, I've heard there's like 50 of them hidden all over the property. And of course, Charlotte is right out in the middle of everything. And what we're talking about is a, how, how long is it's this? about a 30 foot diameter spider. Yes, a 30 foot diameter metal spider right in the middle of the track. And they've got all these different metal art projects scattered throughout. How many are there and how did that get started? Well, I wish I could give you an exact number. <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of like a, a hallowed ground, burial ground. Every morning we come in, something different shows up. It and, seems and this, to be that way. This is George Barber. He is very unique. <laughs> he has an amazing sense of humor. And uh, unpredictable is a good word to use. Yeah, I love the, and, the witch hanging under the, uh, the, the bridge. That is correct. <laughs> but these are pieces that, you know, there's an expectation. And there's, um, you know, there's a professionalism to things. And people come in professional expecting certain things to be a certain way. And you walk in to a 30-foot spider, and it's like, you gotta be kidding me. But no. then it's like, but I get it, you know. And in the artwork around that, we've got some very well done professional pieces of art, and we got some whimsical pieces of art. Uh, and it's just the way of being a little bit different uh, and being unique, and people talk about us. It is definitely a conversation starter. And somebody says, well, I had my picture taken when I was coming around T5, and you know, there was a spider, you know, positioned over my car. I think I have that same shot from Motorsports me uh, Media. Well, we've got three ants down here in a hole that one of the ants is toting a full-size motorcycle back to its nest. <laughs> I think I've seen that one. Well, we're about to wrap up here. Can you tell me, under normal circumstances, what are the hours where people can come visit you here? Yeah. Well, as everyone knows right now, we're under the COVID-19 right. situation, so we um, have not opened and, and will not open until it's safe to open. Mm -hmm. But our normal hours, we open at 10 in the morning and close at 6 in the evening during the weekdays. We open at noon on Sundays and close at 6 during summertime hours. Okay. Uh, during the wintertime, uh, in the uh, beginning of October, we start closing at 5. But of course, we've got the Vintage Festival coming up in October, where it's uh, one of the largest gathering of vintage motorcycles in the country now. Mm -hmm. And we'll have extended hours for that. And we're still on for that. You know, this rumor mills cook, as we talked earlier about the, the Google Net. You can, you can say one thing out there and it becomes gospel, but it is official that as of this moment, the Barber Vintage Festival is still on. Okay. And the website for the museum is barbermuseum.com? Barbermuseum.org. Uh, org. Dot org, dot org. Yes, correct. Really, go check out that. They do a, this incredible drone flyover of the track and the, the grandstands, and then they, they, fly, they hover over the actual museum. The big building, that is the museum that we're in right now. It is unbelievably impressive. And tell you what, guys, we're about to wrap this up because he, Jeff, uh, has graciously said that he will take us down below and we're going to do a couple of videos where we actually do a, a tour and an interview 
of down in the restoration area and maybe take a look at some of my favorite machines and uh, we're actually going to edit those videos and set them live at a later date so we are going to go ahead and wrap up this uh, and Jeff I just want to say thank you for opening your doors and uh, letting us come in and spend a little time with you and a answering a bunch of uh, questions that we had flow in. Well, it's ours to share and we enjoy sharing it with the interested folks out there. All right, guys, well, we're going to wrap it up and we will see you next week, three o'clock. I will probably ba be back in the studio. Not quite as exciting as this, but I'll be back to answering all your questions uh, as far as repairing your machines. Once again, thanks for dropping in, spending a little bit of time with us, and we will see you next week. Y'all have a great weekend. God bless.